Recently, Amtrak has been discussing concepts for replacing its fleet of Superliner passenger cars, and I've been following along with every update. Should the new trains be single-level or bi-level? Should they come in fixed train sets or individual cars that can be used more flexibly? How should accessibility laws apply to trains? And why is this even an issue that I'm interested in? It's an important issue to follow if you are, say, pitching a new train station, because you should probably build your platforms to match the type of train traffic typical for the area. This is an unexpectedly complicated issue, since, in the United States, there are several competing standards. Back east, it is common to use high-level platforms that range between 48 and 51 inches above the top of the rail. This is based on the floor height of passenger cars, which, in the USA, have thankfully been standardized to a height of 4 feet 3 inches above the top of the rail, or 51 inches. This height is needed to pass above the wheels and associated structure, and allow passengers to walk between cars without going up and down stairs. Platforms that match this height make boarding easier, faster, and more accessible. For as much as people like to hold up European trains as some sort of gold standard, American trains are actually better in this one regard, since you will be hard-pressed to find any European intercity passenger trains with level boarding. But that standard is mainly confined to the Northeast, with a handful of exceptions. In the rest of the country, we've settled on a standard of 8 inches above the top of the rail. This is an improvement over the previous standard of no platform at all, which required conductors to place an 8-inch step stool on the ground as passengers boarded and exited. In general, and not just for trains, the typical vertical rise per step on a typical set of stairs is between 7 to 9 inches, and most rail cars settled on a standard of an 8-inch step stool followed by 5 built-in stairs up to the usual 51-inch floor height of the car. These stairs are sometimes covered by a movable trap door so that the car can stop at high-level platforms too. The reason for not constructing high-level platforms in the first place was primarily cost, since building the structure of a high platform is both expensive and requires regular maintenance, which often can't be justified for low volumes of passengers. But there is also a physical consideration too. Passenger trains are usually only 10 feet wide, while freight trains have grown to be 10.8 feet wide. This width doesn't necessarily apply to the actual measured width of the freight cars themselves, and instead includes the dynamic envelope, which is the distance that trains rock back and forth when in motion. A swaying freight train, or even an express passenger train, has the potential to lean out and impact with a platform built too close to the tracks. This means that anywhere there are freight trains, any structure above 8 inches tall must be moved back from the tracks, which would leave an enormous gap between the platform and the passenger car. This has led to several creative solutions from transit agencies who want level boarding, such as these drawbridge type things in San Diego that lower down during the hours when passenger trains use the tracks, but raise up at night when freight trains have trackage rights. Or these tracks within tracks, called gauntlet tracks in Sonoma, California, where freight trains are routed onto these two rails farther away from the platform. Neither of these options are cheap and neither is a suitable solution for creating a national standard. Instead, the best answer so far, in my opinion, has been to include the gap-filling infrastructure not on the platforms, but on the passenger trains. Gap fillers are not uncommon in transit systems around the world, but were introduced to the United States in a very big way by Brightline in Florida. These consist of a retractable floor that extends out whenever the doors open. This allows Brightline passengers to have a seamless and accessible boarding experience, while also allowing freight trains to pass through on the same tracks without needing to raise drawbridges or switch to gauntlet tracks. My opinion is that this should be the new North American railroad industry standard. If I had my way, all new platforms being built for intercity passenger trains in the United States would be 51 inches tall above the top of the rail and would be 5.5 feet back from the center of the track. Simple, sure, but would this really solve the problem? Unfortunately, no. Because, in fact, not all passenger cars follow the standard floor height of 51 inches above the top of the rail. Bi-level passenger cars can certainly be built so that a portion of the 51-inch floor height is included. New Jersey Transit's multi-level coach is a great example, but this greatly limits the utility of the bi-level design. For transit applications, it is more efficient and convenient to allow passengers to board on the bottom level than circulate up to the upper level as the train gets going. Separation from the doors below provides an extra tranquility to the upper level, and the lower level can include space for bicycles, luggage racks, or restrooms without compromising the rest of the car. Most transit-focused bi-level cars feature a lower floor height of 25 inches above the top of the rail, which is too high for level boarding on tracks shared with freight trains. So in nearly every system that runs these cars, 
an 8 inch platform is used, with two 8.5 inch steps attached to the car to climb the rest of the way up into the lower level. The lone exception is, for now, UTA's Front Runner, which manages level boarding of bi level cars because it runs entirely on its own tracks. For accessibility, most other systems rely on these high blocks on platforms, set back from the tracks where a conductor or other employee can place a bridge plate to spend the distance into the train car. UTA provides bridge plates as well, if requested. Just ask your friendly neighborhood train host for assistance. But many passengers with strollers or with wheelchairs don't even bother. Times could be changing, with agencies such as Toronto's Go seeking level boarding of its entire network, but since they share their tracks with freight trains, they may need to employ automatic gap fillers, just like Brightline, but at a lower height. Or perhaps the better solution is for commuter trains to have their own track, at least at stations. Or for a third option, it's time we examine the other common class of bi-level passenger car, the Amtrak Superliner. Come aboard our magic world on wheels, where your eyes are filled with wonder, and there's friendship all around. The Superliner Experience There's nothing quite like it on a Amtrak way Amtrak Superliners are based off the Santa Fe high-level cars, developed by Bud for the El Capitan Streamliner in the early 1950s. These cars were the combination of two other rail car innovations happening at about the same time, the Observation Dome car and the bi-level commuter car, what we would call today the gallery car, both of which utilized the two-level design for very different reasons. In the commuter car, the main purpose was increased capacity, while for the dome observation car, the intent was to provide better views for the passengers. Applying the two-level design to intercity coach cars achieved both of these goals at the same time, though with one major caveat for the views, which I will get back to later. The floor of the new high-level car was raised from 51 inches to 104.5 inches, making the car around 16 feet tall, or as tall as a standard freight locomotive today. This allowed a lower deck to be opened up between the wheels of the car, which could be filled with mechanical equipment, restrooms, and additional lounge space. High-level coach cars could carry about 40% more passengers than the traditional single-level coaches, and do so without the significant weight of an additional passenger car or without the wear and maintenance issues of additional axles and trucks. Most impressively, however, was the dining car, which not only provided the expected increase in capacity by opening the entire upper level to dining space, but also included its own kitchen in the lower level, eliminating the need for a separate car. These cars could feed a lot of people, train loads even. While the high-level cars arrived too late to make a meaningful impact on the private passenger rail landscape, their popularity and efficiencies did not go unnoticed. Only seven years after Amtrak took over national passenger rail operations, the first superliners began to be delivered, which continued to improve and expand on the high-level concept. Over the last 45 years, these cars have proven their viability as being an efficient and economical means of providing comfortable transportation to millions of paying passengers. They aren't without their compromises, though. Because of their height, they are unable to run on the Northeast Corridor, which has multiple tunnels built specifically for shorter passenger equipment. Contrary to popular belief, the overhead electric catenary is not a concern, except, again, inside those low-clearance tunnels. But this limitation means that Amtrak is forced to run essentially two networks of trains, made up of single-level and bi-level fleets of cars. This used to be the case for Amtrak's locomotive fleet as well, with the iconic F-40s, which were just as tall as the Superliners, being unable to serve all of Amtrak's routes. However, beginning with the Genesis locomotives in the 1990s, Amtrak has steadily standardized its fleet of locomotives to be no taller than 14 feet tall, so that any locomotive can operate on any route. Many observers claim it would be wise for Amtrak to do the same for its passenger cars, so that any Amtrak train could travel to any part of the country without restriction. This standardization would also help bring down the costs per car in both purchasing and maintenance costs, since larger fleets benefit from economies of scale. Both of these arguments sound good to me, and, spoiler, I agree with both of them. But perhaps the biggest compromise for the Superliner design is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires basic amenities to be accessible to all passengers, even those who use a walker or a wheelchair to get around. Because of the steep stairs to get up to the main level of the Superliner cars, 
and because passage between cars is only available on the upper level, ADA passengers find themselves trapped in whatever car they boarded, unable to access the lounge, the cafe, or the dining car. These drawbacks led many to conclude that the 70-year-old experiment in bi-level passenger equipment was due to end, and that Amtrak would be forced to use single-level cars everywhere on their system. But recently, news broke that Amtrak is petitioning the Federal Railroad Administration to change the way they interpret the ADA requirements. If Amtrak gets its way, a set of semi-permanently coupled bi-level cars could form a core of a train, which would be made ADA accessible thanks to the wheelchair lifts built into one or more of the cars. A passenger with ADA requirements could board a designated car equipped with a lift, say the observation lounge, and then be able to roll to the diner, a coach, or a sleeper car, thanks to gangways created by semi-permanent couplings. Some newer, non-Amtrak bi-level cars, built after the ADA was passed in 1990, are equipped with in-car wheelchair lifts, such as the Stadler Gold Leaf cars built for the Rocky Mountaineer. These cars are 18 feet tall, two more than the current Superliners, and actually feature passage between cars on the lower level of the car, at the standard 51 inches tall. Theoretically, it's even possible that a car this tall could feature passage between cars on both levels, which has never been done before anywhere in the world, but which I would love to see. Unfortunately, while 18 feet isn't especially tall for American trains anymore, your basic auto rack car is 19 feet tall, and a double stack container car is well over 20 feet tall, this height still isn't permitted everywhere Amtrak trains would need to go. Obviously, the Northeast Corridor is out, but so are other important routes, such as the Front Range, west of Denver, which has a height limit of 17 feet, or Chicago Union Station, the hub of Amtrak's bi-level fleet. Since I cannot help myself, I created my ideal version of what I would like to see as an Amtrak long-distance bi-level fleet replacement. First, I think it would be best to design the base model of a bi-level car not as a coach car, but as a sleeper car. One of the biggest drawbacks in current Superliner sleeper cars is that the top bunk gets no window, unlike cars designed as sleeper cars, such as the Viewliner fleet. By designing the structure of the car from the beginning to provide these two levels of windows, there would be a lot more interesting arrangements for the dining and lounge cars. In fact, I don't think it really is all that advantageous to build a coach version at all. Like I said before, I agree with the arguments about a single level fleet of coach cars being able to run anywhere in the national network. What that means is that my ideal train would consist of the locomotives and single level coaches of a typical medium distance Amtrak route in the front, which would connect to a semi-permanently coupled set of bi-level cars consisting of several sleeper cars in the back, a dining car in the middle, and a lounge, observation, transition car at the front to serve as the connection between the high and single level fleets. My ideal layout would involve two wheelchair lifts, the first going from the standard 51 inches down to the 15 inch high lower level, with the second lift connecting that lower level with the 104.5 upper level. I had to use two lifts because I wanted to include, and again I must stress that this is my own creation, a forward facing dome observation area that would look out above the single level coaches up to the front of the train. Dome cars once allowed passengers to see ahead, as if they were the engineer, or at least a brakeman in the caboose, and this feature was lost when Amtrak decided to have trains consisting entirely of high level equipment. While I believe this design would be feasible using the current 16 foot height limits, for this CAD drawing I am showing the height of 17 feet. This extra foot would make the dome observation area slightly easier to access, having the same height above the seat as a typical airplane seat below the overhead storage compartment, and would also give the rest of the train 8 foot ceilings. That height, in turn, would allow Amtrak to experiment with another long term fascination of mine, that being hotel pods just large enough to hold one person. These pods would be 4 feet tall, allowing the occupant to sit up straight within their pod during daylight hours, though obviously there would be the lounge cars for stretching one's legs. This would increase the total capacity of the train by allowing persons, who would otherwise have to book a roomette for just themselves, to book instead just the space they actually need, while freeing the empty bed and lost revenue Amtrak could have made. Making sleeping car accommodations more available to single riders would go a long way to making Amtrak more affordable for many travelers especially as night bus services around the world are beginning to offer this kind of service already. I've gotten sidetracked again, haven't I? Back to the issue of platform heights. The Superliners currently have a boarding height of 15 inches above the top of the rail, meaning that at stations with an 8-inch platform, there is only a 7-inch step up into the car, and the standard 8-inch step stool is not needed. However, this step, no matter how small, 
does mean that some ADA countermeasures are needed. Most Amtrak stations will now feature a little shack, like this one, in which Amtrak houses a mobile wheelchair lift. When needed, this lift can be unlocked from its shed and moved into position, but one has to wonder at the expense of stationing all these lifts around the country, maintaining them, and building sheds for them. This is not a sustainable solution for the long term. Salt Lake City, which has two Amtrak-specific station tracks, is among the very few cities in the United States to have built a platform specifically for superliner cars, matching their 15-inch floor heights for an easy boarding experience, but also making the platform essentially useless for any other kind of car. You may occasionally see another train parked at the platform, but the way the stairs align with the platform is less than ideal. This also, I believe, makes Salt Lake Central Station unique in that it has two non-standard platform heights and zero standard heights, so long as you don't count the tracks platforms. Other cities, like Denver, build special high blocks on their platforms where they knew Amtrak Superliner's doors would align, so that a bridge plate can be used to board passengers, very similar to other high blocks used on other commuter lines. But honestly, I think the easiest solution is staring us in the face, especially here in Salt Lake City. Another popular rail vehicle that uses a 15-inch floor height is the Siemens S70 and S700 light rail vehicles, used here on the track's red and green lines and soon the blue line as well. These cars feature an automatic ramp that extends on command and bridges the 7-inch rise without issue. It would be relatively easy to require all new Superliner replacement cars to have such an extendable ramp, so that when trains stop at an 8-inch platform, no special wheelchair lifts will be necessary. This is the third option I mentioned earlier. If all new commuter rail cars could also have a lower level floor height of 15 inches instead of 25 inches, then all commuter trains would be able to use the system as well. That way, we could have only two national standard platform heights of 8 inches and 51 inches, able to handle any kind of passenger car in the country. Alright, so far so good, but what should we do about the Rio Grande Depot? While the logic of current operations suggests that an 8-inch platform is most probable, I still think it would be wise to use a high platform of 51 inches for any state-sponsored intercity service. Amtrak has the option to purchase up to 120 single-level aero train sets after the most recent updates to their order, and frankly, we would be foolish not to standardize with this new generation of equipment for a regional passenger rail network. However, if Amtrak does convince the FRA to change its ADA requirements, it is possible that we are looking at another half-century at least of low-level boarding on bi-level cars. Perhaps my fantasy design of a mixed-level train will be realized, and passengers will be able to board their entire long-distance train using only the high-level platforms, but probably not. So, for now, the best solution I have for the intercity rail platform at the Rio Grande Depot is to make one half 51 inches tall to accommodate state-sponsored trains, and have the other half ramp down to 8 inches for all other kinds of passenger rail equipment. There are several configurations this could take, and none of them are perfect. Thankfully, this is not a decision we need to make right away, but hopefully, as decisions are made for long-distance and state-sponsored passenger trains, we can keep these kind of details in mind. What do you think? Do you have a better solution? Let me know down in the comments below.